really time for that to be behind us. And it was, it was important to do, but that just doesn't work anymore just to have exceptions to the rule. In order to really impact cultural change and have huge numbers of women moving into leadership, we need numbers. We need numbers. And, um, and the way that we do that, the way that we get those numbers, the most important thing we can do, and that's one of my messages, is that we have to help one another. We, you, can, you can be an independent operator and be a high achieving person. But in order to be leaders, and in order to achieve cultural change, that takes numbers. And that means helping one another. And so I'm very passionate about all that. And you know, I, I was thinking about the fact that you as Asian Americans, who are gathering together to think about what that means, to support one another, uh, you may feel a lot of similarities. And Tier and I were talking about that. That there's, there's similarities between what women have gone through and still need to go through as we are pushing against the headwinds that are still out there, which really are about the fact that, you know, the, the, the professional workforce in the United States of America is pretty much designed by, dominated by, led by white Caucasian men. And so as the workforce is changing, which we all know it's changing so rapidly, um, you know, we, there's, there's a lot of similarities between the fact that we have to be multiculturally uh, fluent. And it's actually an advantage because, and I like to tease white men and say, you know what, you haven't had to do much adjusting for the last 40 or 50 years. Because we've been, we were like the foreign nationals who were in a foreign country, a foreign culture, and had to master the rules of the game that were intuitive to white men because white men bought them up and designed them and built them away around their lives. But they're not intuitive to us. They're a second language for women, and, and you may feel they're a second language to you as Asian uh, American men too. There's some differences there. And um, so that's why this gathering, which I know is so important in terms of the support that we need push those cultural edges gives me goosebumps. And I, 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 when I come and speak, I, I do reflect a little bit on um, how far we've come. And when I think about how far we've come, I, I look at things like this. You know, 100 most powerful women in the world just announced uh, by Forbes magazine. They do this every year now. And, you know, when I see... Uh, Chancellor uh, Angela Merkel, you know, uh, as number one. She's number one. Hillary Clinton, number two. Uh, and there's eight other female heads of state on that list today. I think back and remember watching Shirley Chisholm, you know, running for president in 1972. I think back to 1984, remembering Geraldine Ferraro, first woman on a, on a national ticket. And, and what that meant to women when we saw those things happen. And, uh, and then what Hillary Clinton and, of course, Sarah Palin all courageously did to push up against the marble ceiling and help get our culture comfortable with seeing women as leaders. Leaders go first. And then when I see Jill Abramson just named the first ever New York Times managing a female managing editor. I think back to being a senior at the University of Michigan when I am an intern at my own university and so excited to be at the university station, NPR station, and thrilled when the news director called me over on my first day. And, um, and he said, no, you're the new intern here, right? I said, yeah. And uh, he said, do you see the sign here? Don't cross it. Don't cross it. And he said, don't come in here to answer the phone. Don't come in here to put something on my desk. Don't come in here to read the newswire because there is no room in a news department for a woman. And you can imagine the joy when I see <laughs> Chile Rosa and, and how we got there because of the women who said, oh, yes, there is room for us and ignored that. And when I hear Facebook, COO, Cheryl Sandberg, who is, she's a mother of, I think it's two or three young 
children, married to a CEO, and she's out there giving great speeches right now. If you haven't seen her on uh, 10 Women, watch it. And her message is lean into opportunities and bring everything that you've got as a female to the leadership table. Don't hold back. And, and bring what you bring as a woman, the unique leadership skills you as a woman. Don't walk away from that. And when I hear her talking about having women bring all of our unique strengths to the table, I also think back about being at Ford Motor Company when a um, really well-intentioned executive, who was kind of a mentor of mine, said to me, you know, Ann, you really need to stop always seeing things through the eyes of a woman. People are getting really tired of it. <laughs> and I said, you know, Jim, I'm getting really tired of it. I'm getting really tired of being the only one in that room who sees things, or at least is willing to speak up about them, that affect half of our customers out there. And there are people who probably would say that I probably should have been more politically correct at times. But I knew that the way you move things forward is not by being quiet. You raise your voice. But then, those are just examples of the things that I've lived through and how joyful I am about the change. But then, you know, you have to kind of be reminded every now and then about how far we have to go and where we are right now. Uh, did you notice that just two weeks ago, two of the top women in the corporate world were fired in the same week? CEO Carol Bartz at Yahoo and uh, Sally Krawcheck, uh, an officer at Bank of America, one of the most powerful women on Wall Street. Both of them fired. Now, men get fired too, but the problem is our bench, there's no bench. And so when we lose those two, uh, and, and now the great thing is Meg Whitman has just been hired to be the new CEO at Hewlett Packard. But of course, a number of men turned down that job. And usually women get those jobs when the place is such a doggone mess They'll just say, well, let's give it to a woman and see what can happen. <laughs> <laughs> then I see things like, did you, did you hear about this? When I see things about Miss Universe, this year's Miss Universe, and the winning uh, woman is from uh, Angola, but the question that she was asked, you know that big question that determines among the three or the five finalists, you know, who's, who's going to be the Miss Universe? Here's the question one of the most gorgeous women in the world has asked. If you could change one of your physical characteristics, what would it be? And it's just a reminder of, wow, <laughs> is that really how we're still measuring women? You know, only by that? Luckily, she had a great answer and uh, didn't buy into that. That's probably why she's Miss Universe now. But it's just the fact that there's still plenty of work for us to do. Plenty of work for us to do. Uh, plenty of frontier for all of you Gen Ys left to, to conquer. And I'm counting on you to do it. Uh, the women, number of women in Congress has now slipped for the first time in, 17, in 30 years. The number of women in state legislatures has slipped. The number of women in governors has slipped. So we're, we're not on the move, and we need to be. It's time. That's why I wrote my book. And, and, and that's what my message today is all about. And I, I basically knew, as a journalist, I'm always looking for the story. And when I had the opportunity to spend three years doing the research, traveling the world, interviewing, I have 100 hours of transcribed interviews, interviewing incredible women. I was looking for what I call new leadership goals. I wanted to know, what does it take for these millions of women? You know the statistics. There are now more women not only graduating from college, but getting graduate degrees and now PhDs than men. Now, it's a whole other conversation about men. I'm the mother of a son, and so I don't, I don't want men slipping either. But the fact is, is that there are millions of women who have the education, who have the years of experience, and who are itching and ready to lead. And they're standing right outside the, the, the gates. Or, and I'd say it's time to unlock the leadership locker room doors. And if you, if you don't believe me, and there's a lot of people who don't think this is true, you know, a lot of people think there's this perception because so many women are lawyers and doctors and in the workforce and all these things, there's this perception 
that we're all set. Women are leading. And, and that's not the truth. And this is in my book. And, and so basically what this is, 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 is I wanted to make the case where people understood that women now hold an average of 18% of the leadership positions in every major work sector. It doesn't matter where you're looking. Every major work sector. And that, you don't even change the conversation until you hit 33%. So until you get to 33%, it's just, that's interesting, we're going here. Thank you very much, but all the rest of us disagree. You know, so this is huge, is that we are, um, and that's why I say that for all of our achievement, that we are leadership underachievers, and it's time to power up. And once again, I will also say that you may feel that way. Uh, that as uh, Asian Americans, you may feel we have all the education, we, uh, we have this reputation of being really smart and hardworking, but we need people cracking into leadership. And what does it take to be seen as leadership material? And um, so I'm going to um, basically talk about three things here in terms of my message to you. One is I want to begin with a story. Because it's a story to give you a sense of um, who I am and why I am so passionate about my purpose, which is really to help lift girls and women who are so underutilized in the world to, to achieve their full potential, whatever that is they want to do. Uh, and there's a person who has been with me throughout my entire leadership journey, and I want to tell, tell you about her. Secondly, I'm just going to touch on a few of the key learnings from Powering Up. Uh, I learned quite a bit doing that book. And third, I'm just going to share with you uh, the best piece of advice that I have ever received. So let me start with um, my story. This is um, my sister Mary. I'm the big sister of seven children. Wow. <laughs> I have an older brother, Danny, but I'm the big sister. And um, my sister Mary, uh, I, this is Mary and me. Uh, that's me, I'm five and she's uh, two. So she's three years younger than, than uh, I am. And so there we are uh, as kids growing up. And in the other picture, um, that's my dad in the middle. And I like to say, this is um, taking me back to, uh, I think my first day of school at the University of Michigan. And uh, you know, I like to say, I'm the one who looks scared to death there. And the one who's uh, so confident in a dress, that's Mary. Three years after this picture was taken, my sister Mary got up on a Sunday morning. She went out to the garage. She turned the car on. She laid down by the exhaust pipe, pulled the sleeping bag over her head, and took a big, deep breath. And by the time we found her, So what causes a 22-year-old fantastic young woman to give up on herself so early in her life? Well, it was depression. You know, it happened very, very fast. And, and really, a romance with the wrong guy. Those two pieces. So why tell you that sad story? I'm here really today hoping to inspire you. Why would I tell you that story? And I write about it in my book, and I thought very hard about whether I would, and uh, it's the first time I've ever spoken publicly about it was when I decided to write about it in my book. And I tell you that because I came to understand over the years that my sister Mary's suicide is the fire in my belly. She's my passion. She, she's the one that gives me the energy. Uh, I like to think that when I was a young sportscaster, standing outside the doors of those locker rooms, and I probably looked pretty alone as the men were going in, and I was practically hyperventilating, trying to get the courage to walk in those doors and face what was waiting for me on the other side. But I was not alone, because my sister Mary was with me. When I was at Ford Motor Company, pushing up against that steel ceiling and speaking up when others thought, why don't you just stop 
name things to be done. It's a woman all the time. Mary was with me. And any time a woman asks me for help, I try for my answer to be yes, because it's Mary asking. And so I say to you that to be a leader, the number one piece of it is discover your passion, discover your purpose, because that's when you move from, it's all about me, which is what you have to do to become a high achieving professional. You have to master the fundamentals. But then when you make that leap to it's all about we, you have to understand your purpose. And when I come to Texas, I think about Nancy Brinker and what she accomplished, the loss of her sister, Susan Coleman, what she, how she put that tragedy and turned it into joy, and, or in terms of making a difference in people's lives. That's leadership. And hers came from tragedy. But you know what? It doesn't have to come from tragedy. Hers can come from joy. But I'm saying, basically, it's the essential first step. Discover your purpose. So now you know the, the source of my um, passion. Um, but, and, and now I'm going to just touch on a couple of things from the book. The really key piece of this book is that there is now, uh, here's the story about where we are today. We are now a nation of women achievers, high achieving women. And there are three very distinct generations of high-achieving women in the United States workplace today. And I wrote a chapter on each one because we're so different and there's plenty of room for misunderstanding and dissonance. But the only way we are going to put those glass ceilings behind us once and for all is together, collectively. And first we have to understand each other. So um, I named this group. Now, the first group, I call them the pioneering interlopers. So that's my group. We are in our mid-50s and, and over now. And uh, think about, that's Ruth Bader Ginsburg up there. Uh, think about Billie Jean King. Think about um, Andrew Newgy. Uh, you know, sometimes I call us, we were the Marines, taking the professional beaches and taking some pretty heavy fire right out of college. Tough. The next group, I call them the influential insiders. Now there's Michelle uh, Obama up there, Harvard Law School graduate. Uh, you know, here you have uh, the women who are, Sheryl Sandberg, of course, is in that group. Also, women who benefited from Title IX. They had the opportunity to play competitive sports. It's a huge differentiator. First women in the military academies, influential insiders. Uh, and then you have the, and, and the important piece is, is that the pioneer interlopers, the message that we grew up with and moved into the workforce with was, no, you can't. No, you can't come into our news department. No, you can't go into that locker room. That was, we got a whole lot of that. The influential insiders got a message of, maybe you can't. And the difference there was that by the time influential insiders, who are now between the ages of about mid-30s and up to early 50s, and probably a lot of you in this room, by the time they came along, the message was, maybe you can't. But there was room for one woman. And what happened there was, it pitted women against one another. So instead of helping one another and aligning with other women, other women were your competition for that woman job. And, uh, and then the third group, totally different. I'll do it my way, innovators. Here's your Gen Ys. They're early 30s, uh, leading edge innovators, and, uh, and into college, really, is that group. And of course, they grew up with the message, yes, you can. You can do absolutely anything. And uh, you know, think about race car driver Danica Patrick, or Marissa Mayer, you know, the, the social media Google executives, young women. Um, but that's enough of just a flavor of it. In my book, there's a whole chapter on each one. But I thought it would be fun for you actually to hear from them in their own words. So I've got a little short video, and let's let them speak for themselves. I found that today's women just can't believe what we faced. 
I don't know if that's because they think they're more ambitious, far more talented than we were, but that's not the case, is it? During that time, those of us who were trying to make it in non-traditional roles, we knew there were challenges ahead of us. We didn't quite understand them or know exactly what they were, but we had hope and a desire that if we persevered, we could make it through. Young women in the healthcare leadership track often think they can move right up. Uh, they underestimate the depth and the breadth of experience that's required and expect it to just happen. They'll be leaders. Young women today, they believe they can do anything. They have evidence, we had hope. By the time my generation of women came along, there were opportunities. You had to be top notch, really good. There were so few of us, the spotlight was on us. But if you were good, you got noticed very quickly. Any woman of my generation that doesn't admit that simply is not telling the truth. I remember the 1980s, and I felt that I needed to be accepted by the old boys club. I also remember one now former CEO asking me to help him break the glass ceiling. And I remember my response to him, it was, I can't do that. That would be career suicide for me. I can't be seen as the person who's going to lead in that frontier. The general perception of Asian women in this country is that we are hardworking, smart, we do really good work. And when it comes to leadership, a lot of people don't think that we're up to the task. But of course we are. I'm amazed at how women in the medical field treat female doctors differently than males. Uh, during critical high stress times in the operating room, if a male surgeon is barking orders and demanding things, the females around him are helping. If a female doctor were to do the same, they become resistant and critical. I've been able to travel a lot more than my mother was able to, and I have friends from all over the world and have just a stronger understanding of different cultures. And it's really not uncommon for my friends to speak different languages. So I think when you talk about being culturally multilingual, I think we're really good at it. The criticism is very hurtful. Because we aren't dressing this way to attract men, we're dressing this way because we love our bodies. And we're going to continue dressing this way. And society's just going to have to get used to it, and in 10 years it won't be so provocative. That's my niece, there. <laughs> <laughs> so you can see, I hope that gives you a little flavor about uh, how different we are and why there's uh, plenty of room there for misunderstanding. But here's the good news. On top of the fact that there are so many of us now who are ready to lead, the attitudes in the United States have changed dramatically. This also came from the White House Project's bench Benchmarking Women's Leadership Report, and basically uh, the comfort level with women as leaders in this country has never been so high. So that's why, um, you know, just imagine what we can do if we start leveraging our collective muscles. And if there's any, if there's one thing that I hope you remember from my message here today, it is simply this, that every woman for herself is a losing strategy. We need to start helping one another. We need to start supporting women leaders. It is lonely at the top. It's even lonelier for women who are in leadership positions. As I'm traveling around the country, hearing from women who are now the pioneering interlopers in those senior leadership positions, the theme that comes out all the time is how isolated they feel. Help one another. Start here. Start with when. And, and then move across, um, move across cultural lines. Move across generational lines. And of course, move across gender lines. But think collectively. Think about collective power. That's how we're really going to make a difference. So now I want to just touch on the... Um, the seven leadership practices. Remember I told you that when I started working on my book, on, on top of figuring out these differences between each of these millions of high-achieving women, the thing I was after, think about Covey, Stephen Covey, Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I wanted to know what did all those women know? I knew what I knew. Because people always said, Amy should write a book. I knew what I knew. But there's a whole lot more out there. 
leadership gold out there. And that's what I was looking for. What did they know about what does it take for women to lead? Because if you go in a bookstore and start looking for books on leadership, and I've read all the classics, they're pretty much written mostly by men. And you know, they're corporate executives and they're military generals and they're quarterbacks of football teams. And, you know, and, and they're based on male experience. But we can't lead like men. So what does it take for women to succeed? And here's my seven, and I'll just take you through them very quickly. Um, because there's a chapter on each of these in this book. I talked to you already about discover your purpose. That's that passion. The next one is raise your voice. That's about communication skills. It's about not being quiet in that meeting when maybe you're the only person who has a different perspective. It says, oh, they probably don't want my opinion or no, no, you have to raise your voice. It's about running for office. It's about volunteering to give speeches. It's about doing interviews. It's about raising your hand to be uh, the head of a committee. The next one is break the rules. And I like to say about that, you know, I mean, before you start breaking any rules, you have to master the game. And that's the piece of mastering the fundamentals as a professional with excellent skills. But leaders go first. Leaders look at the situation and imagine how it can be and take the risks to break the rules and do things differently. Uh, if we're never going to crack this work-life balance issue that so many women say, you know, is driving them out of work environments designed for men with full-time wives at home taking care of all that stuff. We are never going to crack that until we start breaking the rules. And women have to lead that with men's full support. Next one, claim power. This is all about, uh, you know, you have to raise your hand. And, and you have to go after it. You have to say, I'll lead that committee. Uh, I, uh, I'll take that stretch assignment. And you have to encourage one another. When are you going to run for office? You want to go for that job. Claim power. And I, I like to, I think of women, American women today, as these gorgeous wallflowers, kind of all dressed up, tapping her toes to the music, hoping to be invited to the leadership dance. No one's going to invite you. You have to claim power. You have to go after it. Next one, drink at dangerous waters. This is, this is huge, of course, and this is this piece about some of it, it, 